Good morning. I bring you greetings from Bozeman, Montana, where I'm recording from uh, the basement of First Baptist Church of Bozeman. A good friend of mine from college is here as associate pastor, and so he's making this possible. My wife and I are in Bozeman because nine years ago we came here on our honeymoon and we've been back every year since. So we live in Denver and I'm glad to be able to communicate with you from here. I wanna tell you something that I did during the pandemic to uh, deal with social isolation. Instead of having a lunch with a friend, at lunchtime, I would sit down at a table and if, it, and if my wife wasn't busy, uh, I would sit down by myself and one of the things I started to do was browse YouTube. You know, it, it's amazing how YouTube seems to know what it is you might be interested in. So at one point, I could take a free blues guitar lesson or uh, I could see uh, a, a summary of the news from the week before offered by Jonathan Capehart and David Brooks. But one series that really caught my attention was a series that had in its title, What Life Was Like As. So through the <clears throat> miracle of technology, there in social isolation, I could learn what life was like as a Viking or as a slave in Egypt, like our ancestors in faith were. But one thing that I really liked was that I could learn what life was like as a soldier in the Roman Legion. Now, it would only be a 20 minute clip, but I got some sense of what life was like for people in another era in another time. Now for the life of me, I couldn't find a video that would show me what life was like as a Christ follower in the ancient city of Philippi. So we don't have a video, but we have a letter. It begins like this. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus, who are at Philippi with the bishops and the deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now there's no return address, but there is a clear destination. The city of Philippi. Now if I had lived my life as a member of the Roman Legion during those days, and I had done my term of service of 25 years fighting on behalf of the empire, Philippi might be my destination. For you see, there was a retirement community in that city specifically for veterans who had served in the imperial, as a soldier in the imperial wars. It's understandable that a retirement community like that would be there because Philippi was the center of the imperial cult. At the top of that society was the Roman emperor who was regarded as a god. The society underneath was tightly organized into a hierarchy of wealth and privilege. So a Roman soldier at that time would have a place of honor in that social, in that hierarchy, would be wealthy and would enjoy privilege. He would be at home. He would enjoy the respect since he had risked his life to preserve the Roman way of life and indeed for what came to be known as a gospel of Rome. That is the good news that Caesar and his legions and everyone who fought in one of those legions had brought law, order, peace, and prosperity 
to the whole world and greater wealth to those who are worthy enough to be called citizens of Rome. Some even called Caesar not only God, but son of God. They called him their Lord and Savior, Savior from the chaos that lay just beyond and out of reach of Roman control. Well, meanwhile, somewhere in the bowels of that empire sat a less than honorable citizen of Rome imprisoned for his service to his Lord, not an imperial Lord, but to his Lord Christ Jesus. He too was promoting a kind of society uh, that had its own gospel. It was a society that was organized not around worship of the emperor, but around the mind of Christ. It was called koinonia, which later came to be known as church. And in that place in koinonia, the good news was there was no difference in the eyes of God between male, female, Jew or Greek, slave or free. Philippi, of all places, where the imperial cult was situated, Philippi had become a place where this alternative vision of society had taken root. So there in the bowels of some prison, Paul's mind and heart is centered on this community of Philippi which was patterning, patterning its life around a son of God, not Caesar, a son of God that was not like Caesar, that did not rise up from an elite family and through the ranks to become divine, but one that was in the beginning, according to Paul, in the form of God. But then in human likeness, he was born, humbling himself to the point where he died on a Roman cross. Now, that little group in Philippi who heard Paul preach that gospel of this downwardly mobile Christ and had taken it to heart, now in his name, in Jesus' name, they were blessing the poor not ignoring them. They were healing the sick, not turning away, because they were treating them as children of God. A community living out that kind of life is blessed. But sometimes the pressure of living out that kind of a life breaks open that community. And Paul hears on the occasion of this letter, writing this letter, that they are having some trouble. Now, we can see through the lines of the letter what, what it was that threatens to break that community apart. There, there are two prominent leaders have been fighting and folks have been taking sides. Some of Paul's enemies have come back into that little church, that little gathering at Philippi, and were saying that Paul's credentials were bogus. He wasn't one of them. He didn't know Jesus in the flesh. Therefore, he was not qualified to preach this good news that there was no difference between Jew or Greek, male or female, slave or free. But there was also evidence that in spite of all that, the same mind that was in Christ Jesus was in them still. Someone, according to the letter, was encouraging someone else. Another was consoling someone in love. There was among them a spirit of sharing of overcoming difference, 
and having compassion for one another as fellow human beings and offering sympathy for those who had experienced loss. Maybe even sympathy for those who were enduring some kind of suffering or another. In that kind of society, these kind of simple human virtues were in short supply. So when the Philippians opened the letter and as was the practice then heard it read to them aloud, they recognized themselves like we recognize ourselves. We know what it's like to be in trouble these days. And frankly, the problems that the Philippians seem to be suffering pale in comparison to what we're facing do I even need to name them for you? Pressures like we are facing as people who are organized in these fellowships called koinonia and churches. Pressures are so great that we are tempted to withdraw from compassionate attention to others and attend only to ourselves and our survival. Pressures like that can break us open and drive our wedge between us. The church that I usually attend is Sixth Avenue in Sixth Avenue United Church of Christ in Denver. And each Sunday during the time of prayer, we hear about some of the pressures that threaten to break us. For example, the Sunday after, Juth, after Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg died, one of the members of our church said, I just, I just feel broken. I just feel broken. Now, we don't have a letter that the Christians in Philippi wrote to Paul, but maybe that letter had in it some sentiment like that. We feel broken, Paul. It's very hard to live a life, as you call it, worthy of the gospel. In our kind of world, it's hard. The self-interest, the pride, the corruption are just too prevalent. We need help. Well, they must have been surprised by Paul's response to that. He said, my beloved, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, as if to say, I'm in prison. I'm not available to come to you and help you. You're all grown up now as a church. Rest assured, the mind of Christ is in you. It's evident. You might feel broken right now, but I assure you, you are also blessed. So go ahead. Make my joy complete. Come together and be the church. And I think if Paul knew us, if he was somehow able to reach from the communion of saints and knew what was causing us to feel so troubled in our own situation, causing us to fear and tremble. He'd say something like this to us, I think. My beloved, you're going to have to work out what it means to be a faithful witness in your world by living a life together that is worthy and that represents, that demonstrates the gospel no consultant, no pastor, no politician can come to rescue from the situation that you're in. But listen, you're ready for this. You are all grown up now. You are mature as a church. You have what it takes for you. Yes, you have in you the mind of Christ. I think that's 
what Paul would have said had he, had he known us. But listen to what one of our own leaders has to say. Stephen Charleston is a Choctaw leader and bishop in the Episcopal Church, and he put it this way. Now is the moment for which a lifetime of faith has prepared you. It has given you the tools you need to respond, to proclaim justice, while standing for peace. Long ago, the Spirit called you to commit your life to faith. Now you know why. You are a source of strength for those who have lost hope. You are a voice of calm in the midst of chaos. You are a steady light in the midst of darkness. The time has come for you to be what you believe. My siblings in Christ, in Boulder, and whoever might be listening to this, my siblings in Christ, the time has come for us to be what we believe. May it be so.